Okay, so welcome everyone. This is the 11th uh, in, the, in the sort of 11-part series on the Uppsala Big Data Meetup. And um, today, Dan Sprongberg is going to show us how to install Linux. Um, and Spark. Spark. <laughs> uh, sorry, yes. Uh, how, to, how, to, how to install Spark on a Linux cluster without root access. And um, so I'm Raz. I started this meetup, and hopefully others will continue organizing and continuing it. I'll still be involved. And um, this is sort of the audience so far today. And um, I'll let Dan take the day. All right, so let's go to, to my screen. Uh, so welcome, everyone. So this is uh, the Meetup page for today. As you can see, we'll be installing Spark, Hadoop, and Hive on an on-premise cluster here without any root access whatsoever. So. <clears throat> Let me first tell you a bit about uh, the network that we're going to be to be connecting to here. So we have sort of two layers. So the cluster we want to use is not accessible from the outside. Uh, so first off, we have to connect to a server from the outside that has access to the servers on the inside. The servers on the inside are called Haddock. And that's where we're going to be installing Spark and, uh, and Hadoop and everything. Uh, it has a network file system, which is pretty nice for us, since we just need to upload everything to, to one computer and everything will be fine. Um, one thing <clears throat> that would be good to start with is setting up uh, SSH connections. So this is, I will, I will sort of not go through this in detail, but basically just Google any kind of guide for how to set up uh, passwordless SSH logins. Uh, <clears throat> and I guess you can show your instructions. Later. Yeah, uh, and this is sort of some instructions I've written for, for getting Spark running in standalone mode, uh, which also contain some instructions for or setting up rootless uh, SSH logins. So the the key parts is basically you need to generate some a new pair of keys for whichever whichever machine is going to be your your master for your cluster, so that it can log into all your workers with this key without using passwords. Otherwise, you'll have to enter your password many 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 times. Uh, so also, uh, one thing I will show you my, uh, my uh, SSH config file. Um, so let's just do like this. This is basically my, just my, my, my config file. I've also set up um, this thing here where I can SSH directly to to the Haddock machines through this machine called Obel, which is reachable from the outside. Uh, we'll need to use some, some more configurations inside the cluster because of how the network is set up, but we'll, we'll get there when we get there. It might be worth pointing out that the proxy command part is what you need to do the additional hop via via Able. Yeah, well, thank you. OK, so <clears throat> let's get started. So <clears throat> I, once we sort of are, uh, so what I've done here is I've just used uh, SHFS to get a copy of the file system on my computer, which I will be using here. So it's in here. Oh, no, it's in here. Oh, it's not. It's in here. So these are basically just unpacked 
uh, binaries for all the things we'll be using here. So these are just downloadable from their respective websites. So we're going to be needing Java runtime environment, JRE 1.8.0. Could this you is just. Could you highlight them then? Uh, yes. So, so we have the Java runtime environment right here. Uh, and we need this because the machines we're using, the Hadoop cluster, does not have Java installed. So since we don't have root access, we need to, we need to download the, the runtime environment separately. Right? We also have Spark itself right here, which is what we'll be starting with. We'll first just set up Spark to run in a standalone mode. Uh, once we're done with this, we'll start setting up Hadoop to get the distributed file system running and getting Yarn running, which is the resource manager. manager. And then we'll sort of go through the steps of how to use Spark on Yarn instead of in standalone. We also have some other stuff. We have a Hive, which will be which we will be configuring as well. And also Steppelin, which are which are set books for 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 connecting to all this. Okay, so <clears throat> let's go ahead and see how Spark looks like. So in here we have a bunch of files. And the first thing we need to do is to configure Spark. So we have the inside of the config file, or the config folder, we have a bunch of files here, a bunch of templates. What we will be needing for now is the Spark environment. So we will first copy the Spark-n Template, which is sparkm.sh, like this. Now you can see here we have the sparkm.sh. And now we will sort of we will just configure this one. So I will open it in my editor of choice. And here we have the file. So here you can see a bunch of options you can set if you like. Uh, so these sorry. are environment variables. Yeah. So one thing we will need to set is the Spark. Uh, master host. So the Spark master host here, we will set just the IP address of um, of the the machine we we will like to use as our master. So for this one, I have now I have already SSH into one of the Hadoop machines, number five in this case, and. We just look up whichever IP address it has, and we can see here it's using IP 130.238.58.233. OK. So we'll go in here, and we'll set our Spark master host to exactly this IP, 58.233. So there are some technical reasons for why you're using IPs rather than host names. Yes. Right? So the, what, the tech, what the technicalities are here, I don't know exactly the setup, but using if you if we're trying if we're trying to use the host name here, things don't work. I have no real <laughs> explanation why because I don't have any access to this cluster. It's just a black box for me. It's something related to network configuration yeah. here in particular. Same resolution things that just break things. Right. Now, to be a little bit kind to anyone else who might be using 
the cluster, we could also set here Spark uh, Worker Course, for instance. We will set it to, for the purposes of this, to four. And same thing, Spark Worker Memory. Let's set it to, say, 10 bytes. Uh, now, since we don't have any Java installed, we will also need to set our Java home. So now, where is Java located? I have put it just wherever you put it. Uh, I have put it inside here. You can see I have the GRE folder here. So just grab this. And put it right there. OK, so that's the basic configuration of Spark. Uh, the next step is to set up the worker. So as you can see here, we have a slaves template file here. So we're going to copy this to just slaves. And then we're going to configure this one to, to use our intended workers. So I will just use some, some of the machines here. So I'll grab two for the sake of this. Hook six and Haddock seven. OK, and save. And this should be it. So at this point, we should be able to run the Spark shell on this master. So first, let's just start the cluster. So we run the uh, start all script. And you, will, you can see here that it's trying to start the master. And it failed to launch. Fantastic. Wait, it failed to launch. Did the master? Yeah. Did you extract Java correctly? Because it's complaining about Java not being in the, the Java binary not being in. Mm -hmm. uh, let's check. Where am I there? Yeah. Oh, sorry. Are you setting <laughs> I see. Path? I see the problem. Yes. So I set the path on. I used I used my my no no what why is it trying to run from ah I need to start, of course I need to start it on the actual machine <laughs> uh, of course okay now this should hopefully work better. There we go. So perhaps it's worth pointing out that the reason this works is because Spark and all these different binaries that you've extracted are actually available on all these Haddock machines. Yes. Because your home folder is in a network file system. Exactly. So um, if, if there wasn't a network file system on these machines, you would have to copy all of these files to all of the machines you're trying to use. So can you do a top or something so we see what will you see like the big Sure. Uh, we can do top, we can see whatever everyone else is running here as well. Yeah. Uh, 
Well, we don't see Two PS. much of anything. Yeah. Yeah. So there I am. There I am. All he knows is Dan is running Java. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it doesn't show up as Spark. He just shows up as Java. But so let's. So this is a Finlink connection to the math department. So this has actually access to the Havoc machines. So here we can access the, the web UI, uh, port 8080. And here we can see the web UI of the Spark master. And we can see that we have two workers running right here. OK. And they're using four cores and 10 gigabytes each. So let's try to run the uh, Spark shell. So you add the option master, and you input the address of the master and the port to connect to, which is 7077 by default. So let's see if this works. So now you're running Spark shell on the deploy cluster. Yes, so this is, this is now on the deploy cluster in standalone mode. And you could do this even if you didn't have a thin link uh, or a, a thin client connection by doing an SSH tunnel instead. Yes, if we didn't have this in the client, yeah, you would use an SSH tunnel to to get the to get access to the web UI. Okay, so here we are, and you can see one plus one is two. <laughs> let's do a and as usual. Testing. So let's run a stupid example. Uh, So let's just uh, take a list of numbers 1 to 10, multiply them by 2, and then collect the results. There you go. And we can see, we should be able to see here in the web UI that we have, yeah, the Spark shell running in this one. And it's using eight cores. Using eight cores, yeah. OK. so. That's pretty much it for running Spark in standalone mode. Uh, I guess standalone is the simplest cluster manager, right? Yes. So the resource manager here is, for example, is just first, first come, first serve. So. so if I tried to run Spark shell now, it would just keep me waiting until Dan was done. You would have to wait until I feel I'm done, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and if someone forgets to exit the Spark shell overnight, then <laughs> might be annoying. OK, but that's that's Spark up and running. So let's look at, at Hadoop. So this also doesn't give you any network file systems or anything like this. No. no. Yes. So let's 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 first stop this Spark uh, cluster. All right. So let's see, did it disappear? Yes, now we no longer have the web UI. OK. So now we're back on the file system. So let's go check out Hadoop. So here we have the following files. And there's no config folder, but actually the configuration files are in here, in etc. So let's go there. And there's a subfolder called Hadoop. And in here, we can see all of the configuration files. So first off, we have all these environment things to set up. So for example, Hadoop env.sh, we have yarn env.sh. And we can set up these to use our uh, local Java runtime environment thing. OK. So let's get cracking on Hadoop and.sh. So here you can see it tries to export Java home. And we're going to have to set this to our thing. 
like so. And similarly for the yarn environment, since we're going to be using the yarn uh, resource manager, So same thing here, just export. Oh. OK. So that's it for those. <clears throat> Next, we have the a bunch of other files to, to set up. So First, we're going to set up these, this core site.xml configuration file. OK. So in here, we're going to be adding first following. We have Hadoop. Dot TMP dot here, which is where Hadoop will be storing the file system will be storing the files. So we don't have any root access, so and the network file system has very limited space, and we want to use more space than that. So the option that we have is to use the temp folder on each of the Hadoop machines. So we'll set it up to use the following folder, tmp hadoop underscore temp underscore my username. You'd also do this for performance reasons, because you don't want to send it additional data. You're already yeah. sending data between the different Hadoop parts. You don't want to also send data back and forth to the network file system. Exactly. So, That's the first thing. And then we also need to set where this thing will be. So we set the fs.default file system variable to the place to, to, the, to, our, to our master. The machine we all like to use for our master. So ha five dot math dot u dot se on port nine thousand, which is the standard port. And then let's close this guy. Okay, so that's it for the core configuration. Next up, we're going to configure the HDFS. XML file. And this is the network file system. Yes. OK, so here we have some more work. First off, what you can do if you like is to set the number of replications you would you like to use for your for your file system. For the purposes of this, and since we're already in temp, let's just use one. Next up, we have a bunch of other configurations here. We need to set up the DFS dot name node dot service or PC dash bind dash host and we'll set it to just 0 0.0.0.0. 0 .0 .0. This is again related to these problems with a host name lookup on the yeah. uh, on the cluster. So 
by default, all these services here should bind to 0 .0 .0 0 0.0.0.0 and listen to all connections. For some reason, this doesn't work when it tries to do this by default. So you have to set it explicitly in the configurations. Similarly, dfs.name node dot rpc dash bind dash host this is still related to doing things rootless because I think the reason this happens is that we don't have access to etc hosts and Ubuntu adds something to this host file that confuses yeah. Hadoop. Mm. At least that's our best guess thus far. So, yeah. <laughs> OK, so that should be it for the HDFS site. Now, uh, just one thing. Yes. There's a spelling error at the second property. Ah, proper tree. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. OK. So, Next, the yarn site.xml. Okay. So here we have a bunch of things to set, actually. So first off, we need to point it to where our resource manager is going to, to be. And this is again on, on HA5. And we have to use the actual IP. Manager dot host name. And we set it to the IP from before. Now we're going to have a bunch of similarly named uh, things that we need to configure. So we need to set where our things are going to bind. So again, by default, we're not going to change the default, but we have to set it explicitly because of the network configurations of the Hadoop cluster. Of the Hadoop cluster. So first yarn dot resource manager uh, dot bind dash host. Zero point zero point zero point zero. Uh, Closing tag. So let's just copy this. And now we'll do this for the node manager. And also for the another one for the node manager find host. We also we also want to point the the node manager to where we store our files locally on each on each machine. So yarn dot node manager dot local directories, and this was in following. that node manager host is 0, 0, 0, 0, and not some IP address is that the node manager is run on each machine. Yeah. OK, and that should be it. 
Okay, so let's check first that the files we want to use actually exist. And there you see I've already created the, the folder that we want to use to store our things in. So otherwise, you would have to create this folder, of course. OK, so before you start, you can start the Hadoop file system. First, you need to format it. So this is in here. You run the HDFS script uh, with options name node dash format. So this, should, this should format the file system, hopefully. It doesn't exist because I'm in the Spark folder. No, I have to go to the Hadoop folder because I'm still in the Spark folder. <laughs> so now it should work, hopefully. But Hadoop underscore temp then is in slash temp folder. Yes. Yes, that's in that's in slash temp. Yeah. So that's where we're going to to store all the files in the file system. Of configurations and scripts and everything in my home folder, and the file system itself is going to be located in temp. And I guess you can share all these files you're creating in the GitHub. Yeah. Yes. OK, so let's see what happens. OK, so it looks fine. So let's try then to start the file system. So and here you can see it's binding everything to 0 .0 .0 0 0.0.0.0. OK, so the file system should be started. So let's go check out if we can reach the web UI. And how many nodes are you? Three, At the moment, you're just running one. Yeah. Okay. Just a local one, right? Yes, I didn't configure the slaves okay. one. Yeah. Okay. But check this one. Just so let's okay. So, so let's check it first. So it should be on port fifty thousand seventy. And here we are. We can see it. We have a capacity of one hundred thirty-four point five gigabytes, apparently. OK, so, so so far it's working. So let's try to add some more, some different data nodes to this guy. So let's go ahead and stop this one. So you can do this live. It's possible to add data node while the master is running, but then you have to do add them manually. You can't use this convenient script. Mm -hmm. OK, so here we are going to need to edit the slaves uh, file. Same thing as in, as in Spark. Here you can see it just started on localhost. So let's go ahead and add the same two machines that we used before, HA6 and HA7. OK, and let's start it up again and see if these workers connect properly. Yeah, we can see it connecting to HA6, HA7. So technically speaking, what this script actually does is just SSH into the list of machines in the slave file and runs all the things that you need to run to yeah. connect. So. OK, so let's see if we have the web UI again. Yes, we do. And there's nothing connected. <laughs> Amazing. Right.
Why is this? Do we need to format again, maybe? I don't think we'd have it, but try. <laughs> Let's try formatting. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, we have to start digging in these long files. Yeah. So this is basically, I don't know how many afternoons by now, doing <laughs> basically this over and over. Basically, yeah. <clears throat> so let's first check. Okay, so it already created something there. So let's let's remove this guy first and just start over. <laughs> DFS. So now it should be completely empty. Yes. Good. And you have Hadoop and the other name nodes too. Yes. Yeah. Okay. It's no, this is not the time folder is not changed. Okay. The time folder is just local, so you actually have so to create it. Create yeah. Okay, that's good. Okay, so well, let's go ahead and format it again. Uh, no, name node dash format. Okay. Because the slave file is built up now, we're we'll going to format the slaves as well. I think. So, this is uh, what we're hoping. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, in, in general, just we often had some problem where if there was some issue, the reason that there was some problem, the file system would be corrupted. No. And since we don't have anything stored there, anyways. Okay. It's not correcting. So I guess it's time to dig in some. So why not? Some handsome, handsome log file. <laughs> <laughs> handsome log file digging. All uh, right. Now the fun part starts. Uh, oop. What do we go for? Name node. Let's see if we can find any. Error somewhere. Oh, there's some warnings. This is probably these are all okay. Yeah, fun stuff. <laughs> I guess this is probably the most useful part of the whole presentation because this is what you all. <laughs> yeah. What? There's a one. What does it complain about? Only one name space. Okay, okay, it's just warning us. Okay, so we check our old configuration files and compare. Could it be in a data node, maybe? Okay, let's try six. I Incompatible cluster IDs. This data. Blah 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 blah. That's right. So this is because of the old one, I think. This was before you formatted it. Yeah. So this is this is a new one. This is after, and it's still incompatible cluster IDs. Do you still have the old? file system data left from before it cleaned everything for the tutorial. So do it just having six I, and seven still yeah, have yeah, yeah. ones left. This is what I, this is what I was also thinking. So let's 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 try. Let's let's go into Haddock six. <laughs> uh, ah. Looks like a bunch of things. Yeah. So you can check the dates on it or something. Perhaps you can see if they were created now or that's it's nothing for you. Uh, I, I'll, I'll just I'll just clean everything. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just 
So this is the sort of thing that you don't have to worry about if you have a virtual machine or something. What the? Oh. Oh, just do RF. It's going to be forever. Yes, do it. These are yeah, all the yeah. parts. <laughs> all the parts. Are part. <laughs> there, gone. Thank you. Okay, so these were mm -hmm. from before because these you hadn't uploaded. Yes. So these and are now from, from our previous. Let's do the same oh, for. I do. There. Okay, let's check. Uh, good. And let's clean the one on HA5 as well. For, yeah, for good measure. For good measure. Uh, oh, Hadoop. Trisk. Be gone. Okay. Did I actually? Did I actually stop the question? I don't think I did. The data note to stop, so I don't think yeah. you have to worry. OK, so let's again try formatting this thing. Oh. Right. Yeah, and you're sure the the temp is empty now? Well, now it shouldn't be right because we just formatted. Formatted. So let's see what happens. I think because you add links to the file before the start is no problem. I mean, they will. I mean, they are still add link from the temp. All right. Yes. Yes. Now it's working. So yeah, the problem was we still had the old the old file system from when we were testing this out before this broadcast, and so the cluster IDs wouldn't match. <laughs> okay. So now we have the file system up and running. Now let's see if we can also get Yarn to connect to this guy. So now we can also see that you've doubled the capacity. Yes. We now have two, almost 270 gigabytes available. And again, the more, the more uh, workers or data nodes we would add, the more space we would have, of course. You know, I've half the space of my laptop. <laughs> Are you specifying the size of the, uh, of the file? Uh, no, uh, I'm not. What's available? It's picking up. Um, yeah. yeah. So, so right now it's just picking up whatever is available, On slash minus some okay. thing, I guess, yeah. for safety measures. But you can also specify how much space, how much storage you want it to pick up. Like if you say if you want if you wanted to pick 50 gigabytes of available space on each of the nodes, then yeah, you can you can configure this in in the, in the configuration files. So it's interesting. We Intel nukes have more space than Adobe Canva. Yes. Okay. Uh, you can do a DFN, D with dot H, just to show how much space is available. So we can check. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just a 135 gig yeah. disk, which is a very strange size. But... OK, so let's see if we can start Yarn. OK, so it's already fired up. So let's check the web UI and see if we got there. On port 8088, yes, here we have Yarn. And we can see two nodes are connected. Yes, so Yarn can is different than standalone because Yarn uh, how so? Well, it can it can run applications concurrently, for right. example. Okay. It's it's much it more, it's much more advanced. First, yeah. First yeah. So it, it's a much more advanced resource manager. Yeah. And you can also have applications ask for a certain number of resources, certain amount of RAM, and a certain number of CPUs, and then it will wait until those resources are actually available. Yeah. Okay, so 
let's see if we can get Spark running on top of this. So before we can do this, we need to add some Spark files to our DFS. So we're going to need to make some, uh, some directories here. So again, we call the HDFS script. Now with DFS and, and make directory, and first we will create a Spark directory where we'll put our, all of our Spark files. Next, I will create a user directory and also one for my, my user. Like so. <clears throat> OK, so now we need to put all of the Spark jar files that we, we will need for this. So you do this with the put. And now we need to find the, the Spark jars, which are in here. And we want to put them in the Spark folder that we just created. And now we wait for a while. So this is not strictly speaking necessary. It would work without it. But without doing this, you would have to up So Spark would upload all its uh, jar files automatically. But it would redo this every yeah. time you rerun this, uh, rerun a Spark application. Yeah. So basically, it, when you when you try to run Spark, it would basically check if the jar if the jars are available on the, on the distributed file system. And if they're not, they're going. It's going to upload all the necessary jars. Good. And it would have to do this every time you, you try to do anything from the master or whatever jars. Mm. From wherever from you're wherever running you, Spark. You're running Spark. Yeah. So it would zip all the files and upload them. So you would have to wait this amount of time extra each time. Oh, basically. Well, before yeah, before your job so can even it start. Why is the spirit file system? Why does it need to do that for the job files? You can't do. I guess I mean, it's, it's 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 distributing the computation. Right? Yeah. yeah. So it, the it's of the jar files, right? For Spark, yes. If you if you if you're running a job that needs a, needs a jar file, then you need to have the jar file available on all of your workers, right? And one of the ways to do this is just have it available on the distributed file system, right? Yeah. I think you could configure it possibly to use the local to tell. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think that's. Right. Okay, so so now we have everything there. So let's first go ahead and check our file system to see that everything is there. So here you can see the user directory and the Spark directory. So let's check the Spark directory here. We have the jars, and here are all of them. In many, many Nine pages. pages. Nine pages of your files. OK. So far, so good. Now, before we can do anything with Spark, we need to go back and make one more configuration in Spark. Uh, I don't have to run from there. I can run it from here. Uh, oh, I have many folders down. OK. Oh. So we have one file here, uh, there, sparkdefaults.conf. So this is a template. We will copy this to just sparkdefaults.conf, like this. Open. And what we will need to set here is we'll need to point Spark to where our jars are stored on the distributed file system. So we use HDFS, or first the variable spark.yarn.archive. And it can find it in HDFS at Spark. Dash. Dash. Call on dash dash yeah. to get to get to the yeah. URI, URI and then slash bark. Isn't it jar as well? 
I don't know. Because I have not written this file. down. Yeah. And when you did it before, I think you uploaded all the jar files. Right. Let's try and let's do I this. this. OK, so now let's try to submit uh, a job for, for our dear cluster. Work submit. And let's run one of the examples or dot apache dot spark dot examples dot spark. Fantastically Hi. long Java. Yes. Class name. And now for the master, instead of pointing it to, to the IP of the master node, we just say yarn. And the reason you know, it knows why is because we set an environment variable which told it where to find the Hadoop configuration. All right. So now also deploy mode cluster. Now the actual jar we want to run, Spark examples. And this thing. And yes, this is what I thought. We forgot to set Hadoop home. Okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. So so let's go back to to um, Spark dash n n yeah. that doesn't exist. There. And let's also, it should work, I think, if we point it to Hadoop home. Right? So, where do we have Hadoop? It's here. So, the reason this is needed is. Because rather than when you use yarn as the master, rather than specifying the IP address to connect to, you specify where the whole Hadoop configuration is, and then it fetches all the connection yeah. information that it needs from these configuration files. OK, so let's go back to Spark and try again. Where do we have there? OK. No, it's still complaining. We okay, so, maybe, so we need the conf there. Okay. This looks better. At least it's small. <laughs> So we can see that the, our, our job has been accepted. And now it's running, yeah. OK, so it completed. So let's go back to, to, to our yarn cluster here, and let's see. Here we can see our application, Spark, running the Spark Pi example. It says it finished and succeeded. So let's see what we got. You can see it ran on Haddock 6. So let's check the logs. Pi is roughly 3.14408 and so on. Yeah. Two decimals. It got two decimals <laughs> right at least. OK, fantastic. So now we submitted a job, successfully submitted a job to the Yarn Resource Manager, and it completed. OK. So, next step, I so guess. Is this yep. like, uh, can you show the, the, the file that was, that you submitted? It's, it should be in the examples, right? The Pi file? Uh, yeah. But uh, just the jar file? Yeah, it's, it was this, the, the thing was, was this thing, right? The Spark, oh, yeah. Spark examples. So, it's, it's basically a big jar of examples. Yeah. And you you specify the Spark class for whichever if, thing if, you want to run. If you Google right? Spark Pi dot Scala, you can see the source code. So maybe it's nice to see the course code. It's just a couple of lines. Yeah. Sure, sure, sure. We can we can do this. So so let's just 
Google. Uh, it's in the Spark folder. Spark. Hi. Uh, Scala. It's in the Scala. Like this. Okay. It just to GitHub. Right. Yeah. It usually comes in the Spark folder. Probably yeah. So here's here's the the source code for so for the example we just ran. Did a print and, and so you're how are, so you're saying oh I see you're saying it in standard standard out. Yeah. And, okay. I got it. Yeah. So if you go back to yeah. the logs and go back, you can see that. So this is actually. So standard. yeah, you you can see std r and std out for 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 this worker. Yeah. Right. Cool. Anything else? Now we have distributed storage, and we have yeah, distributed computation. Yeah. So now, next thing on, on the list is Hive. This is the data, basically the sort of database type system. Yes. So now we go into the Hive folder. No, ah, it's because we are two levels deep. There we go. Again, pretty standard. You see a bin folder with the scripts. You have a conf folder, which we will need to edit some files in. So let's check out the configuration folder first. Here you see a bunch of things. The thing we'll be editing now is the following, the hive and dot sh. So first, of course, we need to copy this template. So just cp hive to just hive and dot sh. So and let's open. So if you if you read this, you can sort of see what we will need to to set here, right? You have Hadoop home, it wants you to set. You can set hive configure if you like. Of course we'll also need to set the Java home. So let's just do all of this. Uh, let's speak back and uh, Do this. Oops. That's the Java home. That's Hadoop home. Like so, I think we need to set Hive home. I doubt it. I doubt it, yeah. It might be worth pointing out at this point that everything is running under Don's user. So since we don't have any type of root access, we can't make anything yeah. run. We can't have these running as separate users. Yeah. Right, so that should be it. So let's go into Hive again. Is it the Hadoop home here or Confident? Uh, so far, I mean, it's, it seems Hadoop home should work. Uh, they, you, you can see here that they're setting Hadoop home. Uh, but probably you could also do it with Hadoop Conf there, maybe. Right, so let's go in and run. Hive server two. Okay, so it Can seems to be run running. Uh, oh yeah, that's 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 true. We need to do all of that thing, all of those things. Uh, SEMA tool. Uh, oh, what was all? The, do you remember all the commands? I forgot to write them down, unfortunately. And the reason I'm asking is you have 
uh, Hadoop form. Yeah. Uh, also, you have export uh, Hive config. So I don't know if Hive config actually. Yes. Yeah, so so Hive config is just you. If you like, you can you can have your configuration files for Hive somewhere else. Uh, and you can explicitly point it to different different configurations. Yeah. Otherwise, it will just use your the standard config directory in, in the in the Hive home. You might, for example, not want to store all the software on your network file system, but you might want to store the configuration files on the network file system. So to make sure that the configuration files are synced across all the Derby and but, uh, you in, 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 uh, as far as I understood, since it's a distributed file system, really we need the base software running environment on all of those. Yes. And uh, so essentially uh, uh, so you have one master which you have a storage in each scheme okay. all these states and getting back in your data there. Yeah. Uh, so in that sense, when you have biggest configurations just for your slave configurations and not for your overall system. Right? So but the configuration file is the same for all for both for both the slaves and the master. Yeah. So we're using the same configuration files for all of them. Yeah, no, what I mean is uh, suppose you have one configuration where you're using two slaves yeah. and another configuration where you're using some other slaves. Okay. Is that, is that the reason why you need to configure this? That's what that's, that's, that's my question. I mean, then presumably you would probably not set these environment variables in the environment file that you would pass yeah. them when you start the actual software. Okay, then I'm confused. Then why, why would you need this configuration directory? Because you might want to have the actual software. So in this case, Hive, mm -hmm. say stored on a local file system mm -hmm. that's local to each machine. So you can actually store mm -hmm. a separate copy on each machine. Mm -hmm. okay. And then just store the configuration file, I guess, on the central synchronized file system. Mm -hmm. So basically, you have um, to these of places where you have local storages. And so because yeah. Hive is like a database. Yeah, yeah. And then you're having you can link link it to these uh, local storages to that, isn't it? So I mean, the storage mm -hmm. backend for Hive in this case is, is going via HDFS, right? Yeah. Okay. So this is already distributed. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure in high in the Hive case why you would want. I mean, you could have various reasons, I guess, for why you want to set a specific directory to store your configuration files. Mm -hmm. it could, I guess it could also be something like uh, uh, access rights. I don't know. For some reason, you might want people to just have read rights for the high directory, but be able to modify a configuration file or something. Okay, so this yeah. configuration is more for the database configurations and not for the file system as such. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, this, so this, this is, is only for high. But this you is only have, have the same configuration. You have a corresponding <laughs> option for, uh, for Hadoop and for Spark yeah. or whatever. OK, so first we have to initialize the, the Hive database, which you do with the schema tool uh, script. Uh, you need to type dash db type and whatever, any database type that's supported, Derby, for example, and then in its, in its schema. So this should initialize the database. I think you might have to delete what was there before, because yeah. Ah. <laughs> right. Okay. We uh, so just remove the meta store. This right. Be gone. Okay. Uh, now let's try again. Just to create some inconsistent information as well. Yeah. Schema tool completed. Okay. So now. Let's start Hive server. <clears throat> okay, looks to be okay. So let's go back here and uh, actually Hive. Let's see if we can start Beeline, uh, which is the command line interface. So first, we need to connect it to the database itself. Okay. 
So again, we're connecting it to to basically well the master for the for the for the distributed file system or or, is, or the one the one where we're running Hive server. Uh, which is the Haddock 5, and I'm just entering the IP address, right? And the Sunder port 10,000, and I also want my user. Okay, so let's see. Mm. Yeah, mm, right. User Don is not allowed. Oh. <laughs> Don is not allowed to impersonate. Don. <laughs> so there's a yeah. problem related to not having root running things with root access, I think. Yes. So you have missed some options in, uh, <laughs> in the uh, HDFS setting. Yeah. OK, so we need to go back to this. So this, this was Hadoop settings, right? So. Uh, no, oh, OK, we're sorry, too little steep again. Uh, HDFS, HDFS or site? HDFS site. This is correct. No, oh, OK. Oh, goodness, and what was the settings we needed? Uh, let's open the last pistol. Huh? Open the or old one. Anything. Well, I mean, th this is this is from the from the SSHFS. Yes, but where do we have the old one from? When we had. Yeah, yeah, I, I, uh, I have to go there first. <laughs> so, documents, test, uh, Hadoop. And impersonating Dan, what's the? Next meeting, I mean, yeah, the, the, these are just. This is, I think, related to because you want to have, no? have the processes running as different users, mm -hmm. but you want them to act with the user usage rights of the user executing ah. the database query. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. okay. And then you're using various features to do this. And I think you need yeah, the, the service that, yeah, so the server actually needs to have the rights to do this. Okay. So here you can see actually what's missing. So. We need to set up a uh, proxy user uh, groups and hosts, right? So let's see. About this, yeah. this because I have no idea. If we can just and this was not this was actually in the core uh, folder or in the core core um, oh, no, okay. core sites. So I'm sure core there, right? And there we go, okay. So down there in the name of the property is actually your username. It's, down. Yeah, it's so exactly something my you username. would have to modify if you ran yes, yeah, different sets of billing. For whatever <laughs> yeah, whatever user you're running, you would have to to modify this, right? And it might be better solutions. And if you have root, of course, but this is what we can do for now. Okay, so Let's go back and try to restart Beeline. We need to restart HFS. Do we need to restart the server entirely? OK. Yeah. yeah. OK, we, so we need to. I love that error message. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't need to re clean and reformat the HDFS now, right? No. No. You just need to restart it. OK. It's just because so everything is set. And it'll just pick up those. Yeah, when when we start when we start the survey, it will pick up the configurations. Yeah. The, 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 yeah. Yeah. Or should I hope? <laughs> but there's no guarantee, of course. Well, this is basically a very abbreviated abbreviated version of what we've been doing the a couple of afternoons. For no, I'm still not allowed to impersonate myself. But did you restart HDFS? Uh, no, I didn't restart the HDFS. <laughs> yeah. Uh, of course, you need to restart everything. And everything else relies on HDFS, so you actually have to stop everything. <laughs> yeah. So but this should be the last time we have to restart. <laughs> so then we're done. Stoop yarn, OK. <laughs> stop yarn. So what these scripts do, again, both the start and the stop, is just that they automatically 
automatically SSH into all the servers in the slaves file and run whatever commands you need to run. And we don't need to stop Spark. Well, Spark isn't running. Okay. At least I don't think so. <laughs> we don't need it. It shouldn't be running, but let's check. Maybe I left the, the Spark uh, things running anyway. Oh, they're, they're gone. OK, so. So let's start everything up again. Start the file system. So if you think this is boring now, uh, imagine how boring this is if you do it for the 20th time. <laughs> <laughs> and we change one value in one configuration. When running again, we can see that we have the two live nodes again. OK. So let's do the same for yarn. Oh, it's AJ6. OK, fine. Uh, E88. Yes, yarn is up and running. Good. Now let's go back to Hive and run the Hive server. So Hive server is also running on the other all three same nodes, or no? Hive is just running on, on, on one on machine. Mass. Yeah, it's just it's just running on 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 the one machine. But it's using the distributed storage in the backend. Yeah. Okay, so now let's try Beeline and hope for the best. Yeah. Okay. So let's see if we can create a table. Let's call it test. And let's just make it contain an integer. And it seems to have worked. Okay, cool. So let's see if it actually appears if we try to do show tables. And there it is. Can't be table bugs. <laughs> <laughs> so now we have Hive up and running as well. So the last thing we want to get running now is Zeppelin. Which just gives us a more convenient interface. Yeah. The Zeppelin is basically like Jupyter. So uh, let's again uh, go to our file system here. Let's go to Zeppelin. And similar stuff here you have the bin folder, you have the conf folder. So let's see what's in here. Well, you can see the Zeppelin dash m dot sh template. And again, we're going to have to edit this to add, you know, Java Home and all of these things. So let's copy. And let's open it up. OK, so here we go. And you can kind of already see you have the export Java home here in the, in the comments and, and so on. You can set Spark home if you like. Hadoop conf there. Uh, so anyway, so let's, let's, let's go through and let's, let's add these things. Export Java home. And what was it now? Copy from one of your other ones? Uh huh. 
you happy rather yeah that? that's that's true i can i can probably copy from one of the other guys uh where would it be hive yeah uh, where is there oh so you control to control me or what? Yeah. Uh, I just accidentally pressed control C instead of control V again. <laughs> okay, and let's get Hadoop home as well. Uh, shift there. So most of the rest, yeah, I think we need Spark as well. Yeah, we, we will probably need Spark. Otherwise, it can't find the Starline interpreter. But a bit of the, there are a few other settings for Zeppelin, but those you can do directly uh, from I don't the Zeppelin. Have this. Uh, so let's just uh, Spark. There, uh, hive home, maybe. Uh, I don't remember. Why not? <laughs> to make sure, but we want to do use hive as well. With, but I think you don't need it because I think you just give it the JDBC address and connect it. Okay. Now we have Java Home, Hadoop Home, Spark Home, and Hive Home. OK. So let's see if we can start this thing. OK, so now we're running the Zeppelin daemon. And let's try to start. <clears throat> OK, so it seems OK so far. Uh, be quick so we can see the non logged in. Yes, 8080. So this is again on port 8080. Uh, and it's unable to connect. It takes a while. Or it might just be that it takes a while. We noticed this. It, this, it takes a while to start. So we were, we were looking through logs and couldn't figure out what was going on. And after a while, we just realized it took 20 seconds. And what was the executable you ran? Home, Zeppelin, what was the? Zeppelin daemon. Dot sh. Yeah. Oh, okay. Seven diamond dot sh struct. So this isn't now we don't know if it's actually just take it's being slow or if it's actually an error somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, I'm trying. This is actually okay. So let, let's let's check the logs. <laughs> we have uh, logs. Zeppelin, what do we have? Oh, HA5 dot log. This is Error. earlier today. This is, this is, this is just earlier from this. Oh. This, you're right, this is just earlier from, from earlier today. Oh, OK. Done. Now it's just done. It's just done? done? OK. It's just done at the bottom. So try. Oh, yes. <laughs> it's just, it's just, it's just <laughs> very slow. It takes a very long time. <laughs> I think so it's just early the first time. But it's like what? Something that's a long time now, yeah. <laughs> Something yeah, along those you lines. You have to wait to see if it's really working or not. Yes, exactly. So I mean, if we just said loading or something, it took a minute. Then okay. Okay, so now we can create a new note. I think so we we I think we had access to all of our old stuff as well. This was interesting. Yes, but it just it has to stand up. I think it's something in your home folder. Right? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So let's let's just create a new notebook. Spark test. Okay. Here we are. Let's see. Can we do one plus one? It's going to so take we're a while. We're going down from computing, making very bad approximations of pi to now. 
Now we're at just one, one plus one. <laughs> They're still running. So the first one takes a while, right? Because it's yeah, yeah, it, all kinds of libraries. And, yeah, yeah. So this takes time. This takes a while, yeah. Did you load did you download the Zeppelin thing from Zeppelin official file? Yeah. With the, so now matplotlib and all these things are Yeah. I include I include all the interpreters in there, so it should be that. Ah, now we see. Okay, so let's let's run our little trivial example. Uh, collect. Yeah. So you check the yarn sites to make sure that it's actually yarn executing things. Yeah, we can see here. We should be able to see here. Yeah, you can see Zeppelin is running Spark on Yarn. And Zeppelin is running Spark on Yarn. Yeah. As Dan. As me, yeah. Without impersonating you. Without impersonating me. <laughs> so did you have to change any permissions? I guess everything is Dan executable. Yeah. Did you have to do any other changes to these jars you download? No. Just put everything Nothing. at home and go for it. Yeah. Yeah. OK, that's cool. Yeah. No root, no need to change any permissions. Just download and configure and go. Yes, there's a one last bonus point we could do, which is show the type of works with Zeppelin as well, but I, I'm not sure. It, it's a small extra configuration. Yeah. To show what works with it. Yeah, so you can actually access Hive. Yeah. So basically, you have Beeline, mm -hmm. but through it. Zeppelin. Yes. So you can do database manipulation in Zeppelin as well. And it's it's just another interpreter and it's a bit of configuration, but it's not. I mean you can just look it up. It, yeah. It's perhaps not that interesting. I don't know. If you want to see, I mean we still have twenty more minutes. <laughs> yeah. So if if you like, I can also show you how we configure uh, Zeppelin to to run Hive stuff, which is so. Which I mean, you're just we, interesting we because you can, you can actually do this without without actually. So, for for once, when we configure things, we don't have to restart things. Yeah, but I mean, one <laughs> problem is you haven't actually told Zeppelin to connect to Yarn. This is just something it saved from our old. Oh, <laughs> so you should show this. I just realized now. Right. So how? So if you're going oh, to how do we do this? Yeah. <laughs> we did this only earlier today. So yeah. So sure, we I, just realized you don't. You can do it directly in Dublin in the, in the web interface. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So this was just in uh, configuration, or was it in interpreter? Yeah. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Everything was a bit yeah, exactly. Uh, oh. Please match case as well. No, okay, that's interesting. But it's like the fourth for example. Yeah. <laughs> the fourth. Okay, here we are. Oh yes, this is true. So you have to edit the sapling here to use yarn instead of just running locally. By default, it's just set to, to a local yeah. master. So Yarn is the name of the master. No, yeah. no. Well, well, no the, I mean, the, the Yarn cluster. The, 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 no, the, no, it's just the word Yarn. Yeah. But wherever, so it figures out the, the actual machine to connect to oh. based on the Hadoop configuration files. Because uh -huh, we, yeah. we set the Hadoop home the environment variable. Mm, exactly. yeah, and Zeppelin, uh, exactly. So and no, in the Zeppelin configuration, yeah, exactly. we told it where to find the so Hadoop configuration files. Yeah. So if we tell it Yarn here, it, or basically, yes. really, it's Spark that figures yeah. itself. Okay. If you if you if you tell a Spark, if you use Spark submit or whatever, and you, you tell it to run, uh, uh, Yarn. If you tell it, you can tell it which master to use. If you tell the mas if you use the Yarn option for the master, then it will automatically say, okay, you're trying to run this against a, a Yarn thing. So let me look up the Hadoop configuration and connect with that one. Basically, and yeah, you have to configure this in Zeppelin if you if you like to do this. Uh, now, this means I don't have to do anything 
in particular to, to get the Hive thing running as well. Otherwise, here, uh, running JDBC in Zeppelin here for the JDBC interpreter, you would have to set, for example, default driver here, which we have changed now to org.apache.hive.jdbc.hive driver. Uh, you would have to set it to connect towards your Hive server running. And the default user. And the default user, yeah, which is me now. And also, it has some dependencies, so you have to point it towards uh, the, the following jar. Hive JDBC standalone jar inside of the Hive uh, folder, and also the Hadoop common jar inside of Hadoop. You can show your table before. If you open the notebook, then. So I already have a Hive test notebook here from before. Uh, and you can see here, I can run show tables. And it will give you test. I don't think, well, if it's the same one, then there shouldn't be anything, right? So is this the here it the should just return. Is, yeah, no, it's nothing. Hi, or what is this? So it's JDBC. Yeah, JDBC, right. Which is just Java's standard <clears throat> database interface. Java database. Nectar, I think. Yeah. Right. And then we had, had that this high, this long string or your battery, whatever, was uh, the driver to use, so which yeah, JDBC driver to use. Mm -hmm. OK. okay. Uh, anything else? Well, Spark Shell, maybe. Do we die? I don't know. Let, let's 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 try. So we had a lot of issues running Spark Shell actually, um, but let's see if we can do it. This just started working suddenly for no reason. Yes, I think this was when we, we started high, right? And then suddenly Spark Shell wanted to it was run. After we got Zeppelin running, then it just started running. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Let's see here. So let's try to start Spark Shell against the Yarn Master and in deploy mode clients. So the Spark Shell will not run in cluster mode because. But when you do a distributed computation, it will actually distribute. It. Yeah. It's just that the shell itself will run. It's uh, it's 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 how they request uh, resources, yeah. right? It's different if you run it in client mode or in cluster mode. No, oh, no. Now we have lots of errors. OK. So <laughs> there will be no Spark Shell uh, today, I suppose. Uh, I just the just, I guess, yeah. Ah, it's Zeppelin. It's, the way. Oh, OK, OK. So let, let's. Zeppelin allocate, uh, binding to the same port. Yes, yeah, so so Zeppelin binds to the same port as Spark does. I mean, Zeppelin uses Spark. Yeah. <laughs> we have the Spark notebook. So so let's, let's, let's close down. Zeppelin. Uh, in Zeppelin. And stop. I mean, we have sort of no security setup or anything. We have yes. no access list or no LCL. So that, I don't know how safe any of this is. It's, I mean, it's already quite hidden. So, I mean, it's not open to the internet. Yeah. So if you, if you have a cluster that's actually accessible from somewhere, then you maybe should think about actually looking into the security settings of Hadoop as well, <laughs> because this is this has no security at all right now. Uh, we don't know. Either. Well, <laughs> that's <laughs> but, but you're running as Dan, right? That's, yeah. So yes. But then the system administrators have to take care of the security. They yeah, but right. I can connect to Dan. I can submit jobs to Don yeah. uh, as as you yourself. Yeah. With the the same yeah. And I think and I think it's also it's also you can just since there's no uh, authentication or anything, you can just connect to to the other file system as, as a root, I guess. No, I think it actually has some feature. It, it does. I think it's disabled by default, right? Okay, it should be. I think I mean, this is sort of the point. I mean, we haven't looked into the security yeah. features at all. Okay. So. But I mean, that's a different issue, right? So yeah. those of, 
everyone that has access to Haddock can screw with it. Yes. yes. That's a different problem. Right? Yeah, yeah, sure. So, I mean, Haddock has security features to reach Haddock, even. So, yeah. Yeah. If, any, if anyone is going to screw with you, it's someone who has access to Haddock, which is like either an employee of the math department or a sysadmin somewhere yeah. uh, at the IT or, some, or the math department. Uh, okay, so let's make let's make one more try. And what if you don't specify client uh, deploying mode? I think it. I think it defaults to client. But everyone always says client, not the example. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, so this is yeah. This okay, is so let's check yarn. Yeah. There I am running Spark Shell. And let's try our favorite trivial example one to ten. And let's say spice it up. Oh. <laughs> there we go. Cool. So I guess that concludes this demonstration. OK, before, uh, before sorry, before, can yeah, I just questions. ask one last thing? Can we just do a sc.txt file and read some, read me any, any file? Sure. I'm just curious, like, um, you know, just a uh, local one. In is it just, well, I don't remember the commands. It's just uh, capital F, I think. Capital F? Yeah, yeah. And then just put any, any. Um, <laughs> So I, okay, I just need I need to find any it, file. Then. It could be even um, so if you do HDFS put, you can see host or something. Sure. Uh, yeah. You get the string so is, do I need to put it as a string? Yeah. Okay. I think you may have to. Okay, let's try that. That's probably in the local file system, right? Yeah. So we may have to do file colon slash slash slash. Okay, so it 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 looks like it finds it. Okay, cool. I and mean, then this it could just be lazy. It could, yeah, this is lazy. Yeah. So, so if you do if you do this dot connect. Uh, yeah, okay, I can just I just do the previous one dot collect. Okay. Ah, oh, something interesting. Yeah. Ooh. So I think it's either so it's probably file not found error, right? Oh, uh, right. Input it's path going by HTML. So I'll put some. Ah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Or, yeah, so just do H, you know, HDFS put. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, okay. So, what, whatever file should I take? Do or I you can just do file colon slash 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 if it's a local file. Which I mean, we should demonstrate that it works with HDFS. <laughs> yeah, yeah, fair enough. That's the whole point. I do. Okay. Um, this is what we want. Yeah. Uh, there's a, yeah, really that's a really, really, yeah, just to so make sure it's not an empty read. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, it shouldn't be, but you never know. Sometimes people put it. Okay, there are there's stuff in that. Is HDFS, is it? Yeah. Yes. Put, uh, and it should just be readme.txt. Oh, I maybe I should specify where to put it, yeah. of course. I think it just puts it in the root if you don't. Yeah, yeah, okay. probably. You can check. Let, let's just check. Browse the file system. Uh, is it in temp, maybe? Temp is new. So. Permission denied. User equals Doctor Who. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait. So what is this? <laughs> this is okay. So let, let's let's put it inside my user then. Yeah. Doctor Who. Okay. File oh, it's, oh, it automatically. It's automatically put it in there. OK, OK, I see. OK, so there we have the readme dot, okay, readme yeah. txt. <laughs> right, so now, how do I reach okay. it? User don. Do I just user, do user don readme? Ah, oh, there's no completion. I guess. <laughs> Yeah. Nice. Aha. Uh -huh. okay. cool. All right. We so can definitely go. Can now, right? I'm very, very happy. <laughs> yeah, that's really good. So, in the next few minutes, I just wanted to quickly talk about organization, like yeah. what 
correct. But this we don't need to record, right? Yeah, we don't need to record, so we can turn it off. And... Bye bye. bye, -bye. <laughs>